Welcome to the Pivot Clean Energy Podcast, How the World Cooks, the energy shift you need to know about. I'm your host, Alicia El Mamouni. On this podcast, we are going to explore everything cooking, how it impacts the world, and why you should care. Let's go. Today, we're speaking with Ms. Heather Adair Rohani, who leads the work on energy and health at the World Health Organization headquarters. Heather has led the establishment of the Health and Energy Platform Action, otherwise known as HEPA, and the High Level Coalition on Health and Energy. She has also co led the coordination and development of the WHO guidelines for indoor air quality, household fuel combustion, and is currently overseeing the work to support countries in the implementation of these guidelines through the Clean Household Energy Solutions Toolkit. Join us as we speak with her about the broader global implications of cooking with polluting fuels and why the WHO has made it a priority to work on. We discuss the impact of health, climate, environment, and gender, and how they are interrelated when it comes to household energy. We look at the initiatives that the health and energy platform are working on and where the gaps still exist in knowledge and awareness. And we hear about the elements that need to be strengthened in order to expedite addressing the challenge of polluting fuels and technologies. Come along and hear about the critical work WHO, HEPA, and their partners are engaged in. So happy to welcome you to the show, Heather. Thank you so much, Alicia. So excited to be here. Last month, we were able to address some of the health impacts from cooking over polluting fuels and go into detail about how particulate matter affects the body and health outcomes. And so this month, we want to take a broader look at how global organizations like the World Health Organization is tackling air pollution, specifically as it relates to household air pollution. And you are a perfect candidate to talk about this subject as you lead the work on health and energy at the World Health Organization. And so you carry a number of titles, air quality and health unit head, technical lead on energy and health at World Health Organization. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what those roles are and how your journey took you to be in the place where you are today? Great. That's a very interesting question. So yes, um, my, my totals, essentially, I, I've been working. Um, I actually started at WHO just looking at statistics and working on the global burden of disease associated with household air pollution and, and solid fuel use in the home. And this has evolved over time to really expand because we saw an important opportunity with the publication of the WHO guidelines for indoor air quality household fuel combustion to really integrate this more. So since that beginning, uh, working from statistics, I've expanded and developed a program where at WHO where we're really looking at trying to work within the health sector and outside of the health sector to really make sure people understand what are those fields and technologies used in the home um, that can be safe for health. How do you implement those solutions and what are the best options moving forward? Um, so, and, and in that time, and basically the programs evolved. We, we are now the SDG 7 custodial agency um, monitoring clean cooking access for the sustainable development goals. Um, we are also have the largest databases on household air pollution exposure and fuels and technologies used in the home. In addition, we do uh, statistics for the health burden, but we've also developed a whole in package of tools and resources that countries and other implementing partners can use to really address the health impacts of household air pollution, both at the policy level, but also at the technological level as well. Um, so, and identifying various aspects. In, in addition to this role, I'm really trying to, we've been working hard to connect to the ambient air pollution discussion as well, considering the important um, contribution that household air pollution leaking outdoors into the ambient or outdoor environment has. So we're trying to build that as an important connection. In addition, building up the stronger just energy access connection overall and then its important role in protecting public health. So we are now working as well on um, ensuring um, sustainable electricity and healthcare facilities. Um, for some of the poorest countries there, there's no electricity in healthcare facilities. So we're really trying to broaden this, um, the program since I've been here. And so now I'm overseeing a variety of these activities and, and including like the Health and Energy Platform of Action, this um, various platform that was co-convened with World Bank, UNDESA, and UNDP. So yeah, it's been quite a so You journey. guys have a lot going on <laughs> in this sector. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> 
Um, I want to take a step back and just give a quick overview on the World Health Organization for those who might not be familiar with exactly what it does. So can you just explain a little bit about the overall purpose of the WHO? Sure. So the World Health Organization has been around quite a while. We're in our 75th year, anniversary year. So it was founded in 1948. And it's really the United Nations agency um, dedicated to global health and safety. So it's an international organization. So our member, so our board, I would say, is our member states or countries. Um, so they all have a, a voice in determining the direction and targets of the organization. And, this, and we as WHO work with a variety of different stakeholders, local and international NGOs, as well as governments and other partners, really with the ultimate aim to protect health, where health is defined as a state of complete physical, mental, social well-being, because it's not just merely about the absence of disease or, or going to the hospital or these things. It's really about mm -hmm. the overall well-being um, because yeah. that's, and trying to really prevent disease at the beginning. So. We work at WHO to really you know, connect various stakeholders um, and really leverage the health argument to drive policy decisions to make sure that public health is protected um, as much as possible and to prevent disease in the future and make sure we protect the health and well-being of all populations, um, particularly mm -hmm. those most vulnerable populations. And, and Yeah. And you mentioned ambient air pollution and household air pollution. And I think because we don't necessarily see those, especially in the Western world, we're not really exposed to too much household air pollution. It's kind of hard to um, for those to be a reality. I think that those cause so many health issues for people. So the fact that you guys are spending so much time working on it, I think is really critical. And um, what are some of these initiatives that World Health Organization is working on that are specific to air quality? You mentioned the health and, and energy platform. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So yes, the health. So we have a variety of different um, initiatives or engagements going on. Um, one in particular is the Health and Energy Platform of Action. So this was established um, in response to our Director General in our first ever conference on air pollution and health. In his out, um, he he made a commitment to establish this platform of action to really bring together health and energy actors to working together more closely to tackle the clean cooking and household energy problem and the massive disease burden associated with, as well as to ensure universal access to electricity and healthcare facilities. So he announced his vision and to really bring the UN partners together. So since then, um, we, we kicked off um, the, the, the health and energy um, platform of action around 2019. Um, and since then, this is basically 25 plus organizations strong, such as Pivot, where we have UN agencies, civil society organizations, academia, who, be, who meet regularly to discuss various issues that are going on, various activities, to identify synergies, to identify where we can actually complement each other's work a bit more, as well as to, to have a common voice around this issue and really build the mm -hmm. political momentum, because it's really kind of an issue that you know, particularly the clean cooking issue has been an issue that's been around for a long time and it's it's kind of been stagnant for a while. So it's really trying to, to leverage this health argument and leverage the various actors working together um, to, to be a more harmonized and synergistic and maximize the impact we can have on the ground and support countries in, in mm -hmm. addressing the household air pollution program. Um, uh, yeah, so in bringing all of these different partners together to work on the same issue, you're helping eliminate some of that siloed activity that sometimes happens within sectors. I think particularly clean cooking, we see that often where people are kind of working on their own, but there are so many other adjacent sector impacts when you transition people from cooking up with a polluting fuel source. Um, you know, you see gender impacts, you see health impacts, obviously, environment, climate. Um, and so for you guys to be bringing all of these partners together to contribute to a broader conversation, I think is really important. And what are um, some of those overall objectives that HEPA is trying to accomplish? Do you guys have several high level goals that you are working toward? Sure, yes, we definitely have a, a vision and, um, and, and as well as some specific objectives. So the vision of HEPA is to really make sure that we can uh, protect public health through the energy through energy access, ensuring that the energy access is working well together. Um, and then we have some specific um, 
the specific objectives, just one moment, is really um, one of the first ones is to really mobilize the political commitment um, and, and support and resources going towards this sector and encouraging mm -hmm. more public and private commitment um, from both the health and energy sectors, the climate change action agenda as well, and to bring these people all together working collectively because it is a collective problem for collective action. The HEPA is also aimed to really promote this to really work in country and to synergize efforts at the country level. Because as you noted earlier, there are a lot of different actors sometimes working in the same space in parallel, whereas if they just work together a bit more mm -hmm. um, coherently, that we could really, really maximize the impact of more. So it's really trying to take this global knowledge and these global actors together to work a little more coherently and collectively at the country level to have impact. And we also really want to make sure that we're demonstrating leadership, right? By trying to work together, identify those key actions together that we're all working towards. So um, yeah, this generating action and maximizing impact, I would say. There's also this idea of collective uh, and common advocacy and outreach so that we really are at these high level inter engagements and we're really getting this high level political support that's needed to drive this agenda more. So this is, this is an aspect that we're really aiming within the HEPA and finally, it's this idea of interdisciplinary approach. As you mentioned, you know, there are many different actors involved and many impacts that are associated with the inefficient use of energy in the homes and healthcare facilities. So it's this idea of really having people working on the climate aspect, having those working on the gender aspect, those working on the health aspect to, to in an economics aspect to all come together in, in this more, because we all have some value add and how can we best mm -hmm. harness that and work in it, in it with a common voice, I would say as this is mm -hmm. a problem that um, needs attention. And um, yeah, and the Sustainable Development Goals, for example, really prevented, presented this opportunity to have and kind of an impetus for all people to work towards this common agenda. So this has helped us as um, to bring people working on SDG 7, the goal on energy, and those people working on the SDG 3 on health together more, uh, and work more collectively. Yeah, so a lot of what you do also is just educating and, and bringing information and data to these larger groups and high level conferences and coalitions so that they understand what the impacts are of not transitioning from polluting fuels. Um, and I also want to touch on just the, the specific health impacts globally, because that's what you guys are working on. And, you know, we talked about the very specific impacts of household air pollution with our last guest and the impacts on the body. Can you give us a broader perspective of what we're seeing as global impacts from air pollution, uh, health related or otherwise, but what are, what are the broader implications of cooking over polluting fuels on a global scale? Sure. No, that's a very important question. And I think that the numbers are a bit shocking. I'm going to be. I'm going to be frank. Um, we can. Uh, we estimate um, at WHO. We do. You know, as part of our role as a custodial agency for the sustainable sustainable development goals, and also to just leverage this health argument, we do actually calculate the attributable burden ex associated with exposure to household air pollution from the lack of clean cooking and lack of clean household energy. And that gives us, we estimate around 3.2 million deaths per year are associated with exposure from the lack of clean cooking in the home. And that's just the lack of clean cooking. And that doesn't account for the lack of you know, cleaner energy for heating and lighting as well. So that number right. is probably a bit larger. And you know, as uh, we also monitor just the exposure to get to that number of 3.2 million, we also have to monitor each and every year the estimate the number of people without access or the lack of access to clean cooking. And we estimate mm -hmm. that most recent figures to be 2.3 billion people. So around wow. one thirds of the world's population who are lacking access to clean cooking in your home and, um, and just the cooking. And so this is, this is really, yeah. really important um, numbers to, to gravitate towards. And um, in addition, as I mentioned, you know, Overall, there's 7 million deaths associated with exposure to household and ambient air pollution. So that household air pollution is an important key to those additional other deaths associated with uh, uh, outdoor ambient air pollution. So those are some of the death tolls, I would say, or not deaths, mm. but um, the, the health impacts um, in terms of mortality. Now, in terms of morbidity, we also work to help quantify that. Um, 
and that that is really trying to better estimate the disability associated with exposure to some household air pollution and the diseases that one has to live with, such as ischemic heart disease or chronic obstructive mm -hmm. pulmonary diseases and cancers. These are a heavy toll on the body. So we do some um, we, we we estimate that, which is a very substantial number, um, in, in in the form of disability adjusted life years. Um, mm -hmm. Then we also actually do some quantification of. Um, Actually, we're trying to look also at the, the burden that it has in terms of time burdenness because that's an important sure. um, important lever. And so we're you know we see between a range I think around between two and eight hours on average is spent per week um, uh, uh, or sometimes even per day depending upon the location for fuel collection and preparing the fire and these things. And this is a lot of time that could be spent for other activities and impacting the general well-being and livelihoods of, of people that are exposed to this. So that's another important health or social health angle that, that we work to quantify. We also like to look even we, it, at this climate impacts too, which is another big number where we see you know, 25 to 50% of Global black carbon emissions can be associated with inefficient combustion or residential fuel use. And that's an mm. important short-lived climate pollutant with a lot of impact. So we, I think we take numbers for, we try to calculate numbers for a variety of impacts because these all essentially lead to health impacts and, and, and provides us different angles and, and um, I guess drives the health argument for working with different sectors, whether that's environment, energy, um, social welfare, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's really important because a lot of times when you're looking at how do we transition people into this new cooking opportunity, you know, usually that includes some business development. You have to have people who are actually bringing stoves and fuel into the country and making it accessible. Um, and I think a lot of times governments can put a price tag on that economically and look at you know what, what they can get from value added tax or import taxes and duties. But there's really this other cost that's associated, and that's cost savings for gender and for health and social impacts um, and climate as well. And so I think it's really important, the work that you're doing to help encompass all of those factors and demonstrate the true impact of a transition. And it's not just uh, uh, siloed into health or climate or environment. It's all of these different impacts working together to, to see this huge improvement. So I want to talk a little bit about, um, you talked about global impacts, but obviously living in the U.S. or in Europe, we have a very different um, experience when it comes to household energy. Can you talk about what parts of the world are most seriously impacted by polluting fuels in the home and where WHO or HEPA is most actively involved? Sure, that, that's a good question. Um, I would say, you know, WHO actually has recommendations for all countries. You know, we're all wanting to achieve the, the attain the cleanest air. But I would say the, the largest focus and the, the heaviest burden is held by those people living in low and middle income countries who this, these are typically already vulnerable populations that are going to really have to have other health risks they're competing with all the time, food security, these kinds of things, general safety, et cetera. So, um, this is why we feel that we really focus on these 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 populations because they are where we can really have you know clean energy can have a really important impact and really is it upscale it's looking at that prevention right going up and trying to prevent the disease before it happens because these 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 households often can't even have access to health care so let's try to prevent mm -hmm. them from the need for health care if that's possible so indeed yeah, so it's low and middle point. income countries I think. Yeah, I think Africa Africa is one of the, the largest areas um, where we have, um, we see the, some of the largest burden um, of household air pollution, because we actually see in that country where in some places there's actually the people, population growth is going growing faster than actually the access to clean cooking. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing an increase in those people without lacking access to clean cooking. So that's an important wow. area, I would say. Some of the Southeast Asian Asian countries is another area where there's a lot of opportunity for for tackling the household air pollution issue where they lack access to clean cooking, mm -hmm. and and then there's other places even in, in even in Latin America there's some countries in, in Latin America most many of them have transitioned um, to, or mainly transitioned to, to cleaner cooking overall but there are some countries such as you know uh, Honduras Guatemala 
um, that are still in Haiti that are still have a long way to go. And so there's a lot of commitment there um, from, from that. So yes, that's where we focus, yeah. I would say. Yes. I actually saw an article the other day that said Africa is the fastest growing population and it's also the youngest population in the world. And so there's a lot of opportunity there but also this challenge of keeping up with the population growth with these modern solutions that are cleaner and healthier. So where have you seen traction over the last several years? You said HUPA started in 2019. So have you seen a lot of positive reactions to the work that you're doing? Have a lot of people come on board? Um, you know, what, what sort of momentum have you been able to see as you're working to increase energy access? I would think the biggest, one of the biggest turning points that we've seen in the health community is actually in back in, in 2014 when the guidelines were, these are the first ever normative guidelines on the health, uh, for normative recommendations on household energy usage, really defining what is the emission rates or the emissions that you mm -hmm. need health, um, that's healthy for health. And then this was having this normative, very evidence-based guidance and recommendations. We we're able to integrate that into the SDG seven goal, right? Where clean is actually defined, clean cooking is defined by these normative health-based guidelines, which is was a game changer, I think, because it, yeah. they were very they were they were difficult to attain, but it really shifted uh, people to 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 be achieve to to be working in the energy community towards a higher level or higher tier, mm -hmm. I would say, uh, of cooking. And then since then, the momentum has been building up. And I think, we're, I, I do think that um, over the years, through HEPA and through some of the work, there's a, a larger voice on this area, I think, and a larger common understanding that the importance of this is a development issue for the health and well-being of the people and the health and well-being of the planet. So. Um, yeah, I was, so I would say there, there's various there's various aspects, and and as we move along um, with the guidelines and the developing tools for the implementation that we at WHO is doing and other actors within HEPA, such as the World Bank and et cetera, there that we are able to to really provide more technical guidance around what are the fuels and technologies needed. What are some of the challenges like this idea of stove stacking, where we have multiple fuels and technologies used in parallel that can kind of mitigate the benefits of one clean fuel or technology? Um, mm -hmm. And then in addition, we're giving them more tools to help go to that Ministry of Finance with the, the financial argument of here's the cost benefit analysis, considering these other impacts. This is this is a good value for money. This investment has great return. So I think yeah. there's a variety of various things and tools and resources that are really helping the community, uh, the clean cooking community, to really push this agenda more forward. Um, and yeah, yeah, I agree. I would say even in just the the last five to ten years that I've been really involved with specifically clean cooking. Uh, I've definitely seen a lot more traction in the global conversation around it, which is wonderful. Um, I want to touch on stove stacking really quickly because I, I think a lot of our listeners probably aren't really aware of what that means. Can you explain what that is and how it can be detrimental or beneficial depending on what you're using? Oh, great. I like the fact that you put in the beneficial or detrimental depending upon what you're using. <laughs> So stove stacking, or sometimes called fuel stacking, is, is, is relates to basically the parallel use of multiple fuels and technologies in their home. I mean, I think in, in many uh, Western and American households, or in households in general, we use a variety of different things to prepare our food, prepare our drinks. Mm -hmm. I mean, you may use an electric stove to pan fry. You may use an oven. You may use, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Crock pot, that's one of my favorites right now. <laughs> exactly, exactly, a great time. So this is this idea, and this is common. Everyone, you know, many households all across the world need different, sometimes energy sources or different fuels mm -hmm. and technologies to, to meet their cultural needs, their their their, their palate, to meet the, prepare the foods and things that they want. So this is actually, in some cases, is a problem, right? Because you may, for example, put in a clean electric stove, but if a household's only using it 25% because it doesn't necessarily make uh, tortillas or injera the way they want, and they're still using this, um, this open stove or more traditional stove that's pumping in emissions out into the environment, uh, 
um, it basically can mitigate any benefit that you know you may have received through this using the electric stove. And so this is what we call stacking. It's basically, it's this idea of using multiple fuels and technology in parallel or at the same time to meet your basically household energy needs. So this is really important because yes, it can really mitigate some of the benefits of putting one particular item in. So we as WHO, and I think the broader community within HEPA, we're really pushing this idea of clean stacking, where we need multiple clean op multiple fuels and technology available, accessible, affordable, and usable by households to really meet all their household energy needs so that we can really protect the health. Um, and yeah, so that so it can be beneficial if we're stacking a bunch of clean fuels and technologies yeah. together. They can be detrimental though if we just have one clean and a bunch of polluting together or all polluting. I would even say this goes this is important for this idea of all end uses as well, because you know we're coming from very much a health perspective. And if you are cooking on an electric stove, but you're still space heating, heating your home at, at night mm. with an open fire to keep warm, you're going to lose a lot of the benefit that you're this associated with using the clean device for cooking all the time. Sure. Or if you're if you're lighting with kerosene lamps still or candles and things, you're going to mitigate much of the benefits you could have from just using one from just clean cooking mm -hmm. technologies alone. So it's really important to. To, to avoid stacking with polluting uh, fuels and technologies, but really try to transition to this idea of clean and all clean to protect health. Mm -hmm. Great, such a helpful explanation. I think that concept, we don't think about the different technologies we use as stacking necessarily. And so yeah. I think it's helpful mm -hmm. to frame that uh, in a cultural and, and global context. Mm -hmm. Where have you seen the biggest gap in knowledge or awareness around this issue, both from a country level, but also just from a, maybe other multilateral organizations that you've worked with? That, that's a tough question because it all depends. <laughs> um, I would say, uh, I think some of the biggest challenges I, I think will be is that in many cases, people don't fully understand how clean is clean enough? And I think that these guidelines help define that we have to get, if we were to look at the health risk curve, you have to get to very low emission levels to really be safe for health. And so this is mm -hmm. important because for for before these guidelines came out, there are many people putting out so so-called improved stoves that may have been better in fuel efficiency, but they didn't necessarily reduce emissions, right? So the health sure. risk, although they thought was improved, wasn't necessarily improved from the health perspective. So I think that's been a big challenge in it. But now we know we have that information, we have the normative guidance, but it's actually trying to get those fuels and technologies to meet those guidelines that is scalable and affordable in countries. So I think that's a big mm -hmm. challenge is trying to make sure we, we now know what the clean needs to be, but we need to make sure that the clean is available and accessible on the ground. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's important. I would say something else I think is just the behavior change is also challenging, right? The it's yeah. behavior change of people in the households. They have been using these fuels and technologies. I mean, we've been using for some places for generations, right? And to suddenly understand that this is not safe or not health, not mm -hmm. healthy, or um, it's difficult transition, right? To make. So it's trying to yeah. build that understanding and understanding where is the entry points for to really get the users to, to, to change their behavior a little mm -hmm. more readily. So I'd say, yeah, knowing what, how, getting clean, clean enough, making sure that we have the behavior change. And I think one of the third big challenges is actually getting the financial and political commitment necessary to make the scale change that we need. The investment, yeah. was, uh, lots of investments going into electricity, and we're trying to build on that because e-cooking is becoming more feasible with advancements mm -hmm. in technology and efficiency. But we still, there's, we could do a lot more in just any kind of clean cooking, um, not just e-cooking per se. Uh, with like alcohol fuels and other cleaner fuels, we need to be really investing a bit more to make sure there's many clean solution, solutions available because we aren't necessarily mm -hmm. going to be able to wait because we could be saving lives even every, each and every day. So we really need that right. political and financial commitment to make this happen um, more in accelerated yeah. action, I would say. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. What are those fuels that can fill the gap as energy grids are being built out and becoming more affordable? You know, you, it let's, goes back to that clean stack. How many options mm -hmm. can you put into the marketplace um, that people can access in the immediate and in the future? Exactly. And then you also talked about the the social change. How do you make that cultural transition? And it was interesting because I just talked to somebody this morning and they had mentioned that they were working in a community with improved cook stoves. And one of the challenges that they noticed was cooking meals was a big communal event for this uh, rural community. And so they would have one big fire or several big fires and they would spend time cooking around it, sitting around it at night, keeping warm, having social engagement. And when these improved cook stoves came in, each family was given one and it really disrupted that uh, routine. And so the, the community really wasn't excited about it. And I had never really heard that before. You know, I've heard, oh, well, the food doesn't taste the same because it's not cooked over charcoal, um, things like that. But it was interesting to me to hear that other social impact of, well, you're losing a little bit of community in this instance. And so how do you counter that? And uh, yeah, so there are a lot of challenges in that. Can you share a success story that, you know, over the last several years, something just really sticks out as um, a huge win or, or something that made an impact on you personally? <laughs> um, there's been a lot of successes, right? And I mean, it's, and it's not necessarily me personally, but I would think, I mean, having every, all the countries within the SDGs commit to clean cooking really with a health mm -hmm. definition was a huge success because now people are monitoring, they're shifting, they're understanding yeah. better what they need to get to. So I would say that's a big success. But, and then, but seeing that roll out, you know, India, they, they noticed this problem and they saw the opportunities that clean. So they put their Ujuala scheme in where they really were trying to tackle mm -hmm. at a national level, the, the women living under poverty line. So that, that I mean that that's a big movement I would say yeah. that you, to see governments similar to to we see shifts in all different countries where whether you know Latin America they may be shifting to from LPG to electric cooking or what have you you know so I think that it's it depends on the, the context but I think anytime when I see countries really taking this up um, and and they're using that health argument for a rationale I, I feel that. The impacts being made, I would say that mm -hmm. we work hard to to achieve. Yeah, and it's so important that you guys are providing data behind that because that is what really gets attention is um, being able to validate that this is a real issue and it does need to be addressed. So yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing what you guys are doing. What what do you see for opportunities for the future of how HEPA is going to work? How partners can continue to make an an impact in energy access? I think we just need to keep driving the ambition and really pull this forward. Um, that we have the SDGs, but you know now we're working, for example, with the World Bank to really trying to connect this more to the climate agenda as well. Because I think mm -hmm. some people don't realize what an opportunity tackling clean cooking could do for climate mitigation and protecting yeah. um, uh, protecting our climate environment as well as the health of the people at the same time. Um, so I, I hope that we, we were able to do this. And, you know, as World Bank, as I said, we put this kind of net zero clean cooking roadmap in where we're actually hoping that both that works to really achieve clean cooking for all by 2050. Um, and and it's but also holds it's for low and middle income countries to achieve this, but also high income countries, too, because they can also make a bit of a uh, they can have an impact as well by transitioning yeah. to more renewable energy sources in their own for cooking and heating. So it's really a, a more just and inclusive way uh, of, of tackling this. So I, I see mm -hmm. this as an important opportunity to bring everyone to the table um, to really, like I mentioned, this is a collective problem for collective action and we all need to make it our pitch. So I see mm -hmm. that trying to build this this work in in building the understanding of the important climate opportunity that addressing clean cooking in addition can can have in addition to the health the gender and the other um benefits one can have mm -hmm. in clean cooking yeah it definitely touches more than than just health and so it's really important to be able to talk about all of those in tandem yeah. um, so you've mentioned you know the things that need to be in place in order to make a serious impact on the health space um some of that's investment um looking at getting government policy in place, um, having those cultural transitions. 
what would you say are the top three elements that are really priority in regard to seeing a, a really um, huge outcome in health from uh, changing household energy practices? Uh, like I was saying, I think it's the pol- the political and financial commitment that we really need to get, and it needs to be high level, right? We really need everyone to mm-hmm. sign on board, and I think that, that that I think that would be one of the the biggest opportunities and things that we need to be driving for um, to really and make sure this stays integrated and stays at a high level. Clean cooking, as you know, for example, is always kind of it sits within a Ministry of Energy, but you know, the Ministry of Energy doesn't fully understand. I think sometimes all the the impacts it has and so mm-hmm. we need to have this as i said shared across different ministries and you know we as the health sector we're trying to really leverage our our the trust that people have in their health care providers whether that's doctors clinicians nurses midwives community health workers so we're training them up so i think that's an important opportunity that we can have this a common voice within the health community to households mm-hmm. to to really change. So this is something I see as an opportunity as we're really vamping up is getting the health sector to speak a little more clean cooking. We build that yeah. political and financial commitment, as well as, like I mentioned, this, this uh, trying to build up this connection to climate, get the NDCs to really be addressing mm-hmm. um, clean cooking more thoroughly and seeing this as a true opportunity to, to, to achieve what we want in terms of uh, improving climate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's a big opportunity as well is to really get those nationally determined contributions to have a clean cooking target uh, because very few of them actually do. And mm-hmm. so just having that in the conversation is is so critical, I think, to seeing the outcomes. Sure. We are getting close to the end of our session, but I would like to hear just from you personally, what has been your favorite thing about working in this space? Wow. Um, I would say I've always, you know, it sounds a little cheesy, but I really worked. I've always wanted to help as many people as I can and those people that need it most. And I remember the first time I learned, I went, I was in grad school. I went to the first lecture by Kirk Smith on household air pollution. It was indoor air pollution at that time. And I was like, oh my God, I could really help health. I could help gender. I can help the environment. I can do it all. So I think it, being able to, to work on all these problems. And when I actually get to go to the field and see those households mm-hmm. that I'm helping, that makes that that's why I do it. And that's why I love this job. And there's tons of politics yeah. and bureaucracy that one deals with, but knowing that you're really making a difference in the, in yeah. the lives of people that really need it is I think what I love. I keep yeah. doing this. Amazing. Topic. That's not cheesy. <laughs> I think a lot of a lot of people would want to have that answer <laughs> for why they do what they do. So I'm lucky in that uh, sense. <laughs> and then since we're talking about cooking, a lighthearted question. You've done a decent amount of traveling across your career. What is one of your favorite international foods and why? Oh wow. <laughs> That's difficult to narrow it down to one. I would say I, I would probably. <laughs> um, I have to say I really love Ethiopian food a mm. lot, um, and I, I really appreciate it. It's, it's a very it has its own. It has the spice, and it has you know yeah. the injera yeah. is very nice, and it's it's like no other food I would say of it. It's very unique in its sense. So mm-hmm. I would say maybe Ethiopian food is the one I've enjoyed oh, so okay. much. Yeah, you so. just won over a, a whole country with that answer. <laughs> that's great well Heather it was such a pleasure to talk to you I really appreciate you taking the time and bringing your expertise and and all of your knowledge to talk about what the World Health Organization is doing to combat air pollution Uh, the work you guys are doing is critical and just really grateful we've been able to partner with HEPA over the past year and a half and it's been a pleasure so thank you very much thank you so much this has been a delight and I'm glad to be able to share this information on people. So, yeah. Thank you so much for listening. With over a third of the world's population lacking access to modern solutions and cooking with solid and polluting fuels like wood, charcoal, and kerosene, there are huge global impacts in multiple sectors. Pivot is passionate about opening access to household energy options around the world that also lead to reduced emissions, improved health outcomes, environmental protection, greater purchasing power, gender equity, and so much more. 
Join us for these personal conversations with farmers, fuel producers, distributors, stove manufacturers, policymakers, and consumers to learn about the dynamics that influence how people cook around the world. Please reach out to us at hello at pivotcleanenergy.org to find out how you can get involved. And we'd also be grateful if you found this information valuable and pass it along to friends, family, colleagues, your mailman, your grocer, anyone you know, and find some way to engage. Don't forget to follow us on our social media accounts like LinkedIn and Twitter. Check out our website at pivotcleanenergy.org. And of course, follow us on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts so you can catch the next episode when it drops. Thank you.